So as you can see, um, the longitude of the latitude is equal to the, what I like to call the prolongitude. The prolongitude is this weird Ow. thing. Ow! Shut up and stop being a little girl. That's it. That's a detention for you guys. Ugh, I hate you, mister. Well, it's my lunch break, so I'll deal with it later. Why are my hands so small? Did we switch bodies? Why are my hands so big? We, we switched switch bodies? We need to switch back. What if I don't want to? We have to, I have to teach a class in 10 minutes. Think about it, after I use your credit card for lunch. Or I might just cut your hair. Oh hell no, that's my hair. You're not gonna cut it. Dishal, you're supposed to be in class. No, wait, I can explain. I'm done with these excuses. Go to class now. Time to go shopping. All right, class, so if you look at problem number three, you'll find that the velocity is gonna be five meters per second. Now, the time, if you read it, the T is gonna be equal to two seconds. Can anybody tell me what the distance it would travel in those two seconds would be? Oh, are you kidding me? This kid likes me now? I'm gonna be sick. I feel like I'm gonna puke. All right, class. Today we're gonna watch um, um, Walking Dead. Oh, the Walking Dead! Yeah. Ooh. Yeah, Walking Dead. Yes, let's go. I just want you to write down three of your favorite death scenes. Let's go, the Walking Dead. You to get really gory with this because I think it's gonna be really absolutely magnificent. Oh. Now, if you excuse me, I gotta take care of something. Time to cut it. Oh hey there guys, didn't see you guys there. I'm Jova and I have a new product for you today. You guys can get it for only 
$19.99 and it's called Mama's Bleach. New sale for you guys. If you guys don't believe me, just wait and hear about it. We have people out here talking about it. And then, you know, all the credit rate. Um, I said we have new people <laughs> coming to talk about it, so. Hey, my name is Mario Cardenas. I've been addicted to clocks for 45 years. That's right, 45 years. It's changed my life so much. I used to be black. I'm telling y'all, but I drank it. And look at me now. I'm still changing now. All right, that's it. Now it's my shot. I told you guys it worked. More people are going to come and talk about it. My name's Jamal, and I used to get pulled over by the cops every day. Then I drank Mama's bleach. Now I'm white. What I tell you guys, it does work. Mamma's bleach, buy it. My name's Raymond, and I've been drinking bleach for three years. Um, I used to have an afro, now I'm bald. <laughs> oh, I, hate I hate bleach so much. So much. Hi, my, my name is Zarius. I, I drink bleach for three weeks, and I'm, I'm depressed. depressed. So I still love bleach, and, and nobody loves, loves me. Hey Ray, yeah. come in here to present some ideas. Oh, so, oh, he's right behind me? Yeah, yeah, yeah make that look. Uh, you come in here, you're like, oh yeah, I feel like taking a break. I'm gonna go, yeah. I'm gonna go shoot the I'll, crap no, with these not, guys in here. Yeah, you do. You're I'll like, ask, I wonder which video game they're playing, right? Yeah, I was like, yeah, okay, <laughs> okay. He thinks he's so, yeah, he thinks he's like the A class dude. Oh, look at me, I'm in C-SPAN. I can do whatever I want. <laughs> no, I was asking them to vote for me. Yeah, all right. I did. Look. Well, it's good. Keep the cheating up. It's good. That's not cheating. No, it's all right. It's legal. <laughs> But yeah, provide some ideas. Damn, she's hot. She's not gonna talk to us. Yes, she will. She'll friends on us in a month. Nah, -uh, man. She ain't gonna get my Snapchat DM. Yes, we, yes, she will. No, she won't. Yes, she will. We're a nice guy. No. Nah. <laughs> Hi, welcome back. And today, I'm gonna draw. So the first step is, you have to draw your mountains. Just repeat the process till you get Now we're going to draw a purple sun because I don't have any other colors. Now we're going to draw our black clouds. Just follow.
Then, Osh. No. Okay. Get it, get My name is Javier Pepin. I'm working with Tapa for seven years, close to seven years. Uh, I'm a custodian at Tapa. I take care of open the, the schools and building, whatever you guys want to call and everything. And I take care of the whole maintenance, watch the floors, everything around here. It's a big responsibility, but uh, I like to be the challenge and everything, you know. I like to work. I was, you know, my father, my mom, you know, support me 100%, you know, teach me how to work, you know, get the bunny and everything working. But on top of that, I like to work with the students and everything. Tapa is a nice place. It's the right place to be here. You know, it's about all family. It's about respect, friendly, everything. All the students and everything been friendly with me and everything, you know. I be happy. They make a joke, singing and everything. Very environmental place to work good place. My mom, especially my mom, she worked all the time in the school in Puerto Rico and everything. And I, I was I was thinking like, you know, how's it feel we work with the students and be a part of the student. And when I came to top, they gave me the opportunity since day one. Um, I enjoyed the place, the atmosphere, the people very friendly and everything. And this is a good experience so far over here in top. I want to say to every single student around here, um, concentrate, do your job, study, work hard and everything, you know, think about your future and everything. And that's it. I mean, any problems you guys have, student, whatever it is, staff, whoever it is, you can come to me 100%. You can call me on the side, pull me on the side, ask me a couple of questions and everything. And I'm glad to help you and everything. Every single day is good for me, memory and everything. But I remember the first day when Tapa started at the old church. 20 or 30 kids something like that that's very very impact for me you know that's i still got in my mind refreshing everything when thing happens that's my hobby that's like a distraction for me i mean you tell me fishing and everything's going all the problems uh, uh worries and everything it's only me the nature and i you know think about it meditations and go from there yeah i love fishing that's my number one hobby when i retire i'll be honest with you i like to go with the family my kid you know, my daughter, she don't like too much of my wife either, but um, I prefer to be alone, you know, because like I said, I like to, I like to be met, uh, me, Mother Nature, the water, you know, concentrate, whatever I do and everything. So I like it. It's unbelievable. I miss a lot of people there. My mom from there, my mom stayed there, my dad and everybody. 
most of my family is in from Puerto Rico and everything. Um, but I miss everybody from there. You know, it's very, very nice place, tropical place and everything, hot and everything. Very good place to stay there. I wake up 3.30 in the morning, take a shower, get ready. My wife dropped me up, Miss Pilar. She dropped me out early in the morning, about 4.30 in the morning. I open the building, open the lights and everything, get ready for you guys coming in at the building in the morning, clean out the bathroom and everything until 8 o'clock, and then keep going to maintenance, vacuum the carpets, you know, be on points and everything, be on top and everything. Well, when I first started working with her, I mean, working this place and be together at the same time, the same roof and everything at work, kind of a little bit uncomfortable situation. Like, wow, I got my wife over here, but you you get used to it, you know what I mean? I respect her privacy, she re respect my privacy, and we keep it distant all the time, you know? But I like it. I like a working family. Before, when I was young and everything, I have a lot of hair, but I wore a lot of hats, and I played baseball. Puerto Rico's hot, my man, you know? So. I started losing my hair, my hair, my hair a little over here or over there, so I decided to shave everything. Great. <laughs> <laughs> but I appreciate everything, you know. Every, I always said everything happened for a reason, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I'm here, you know, there was a lot of experience, but I'm here, the more important is I'm here in Tapa, and I work Top 100%, I like to work with the students. The environment is unbelievable, very respectful. You have a good friends, good people around here. And that's it, that's a kick on motivation all the time. And I always think about, wow, time fly, you know what I mean? I remember this kid was a little kid over here now, look at how tall it is, or a senior, is gonna graduate, or is gonna join to the army, but I enjoy it, you know? I enjoy every single moment. I like that. Never have a problem with this student around here. I respect them, they respect me, that's more important right there, respect. Other than that, I enjoy it every single time when I come over here to work. The United States Constitution ensures the American people specific rights. One of the most notorious amendments in the U.S. Constitution is the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms. In recent years, tragedies such as the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting, the Virginia Tech School shooting, and the shooting that occurred in the Orlando nightclub has made this become a talking point in almost every election cycle within the past decade. There are generally two ways our elected officials would act towards this issue. That in the right hands, lives can be saved too. We need to renew the assault weapons ban. We need to end the sale of high capacity magazines. This amendment has also been used in political campaigns. I own guns that no one's taken away. Every year in the past 16 years there's been at least 20 active shooter incidents and that's about 220 in total. In September of 2018 right outside of Providence Career and Technical Academy there was a high school student shot and killed. This caught the attention of many in the local community, and I wanted answers. I reached out to congressmen, mayors, mayoral candidates, senators, and non-politicians to get their input on this issue. It's time for us to come up with a sensible resolution, all right? And school, by the way, and I want to go on record saying this, should have been canceled today, high schools. Right now, we should be in, the door should be open, but class should be canceled, all right? My mind my mind, I'm 47, year old, 47 years old, my mind isn't on the right thing today. And I'm not in school. Just imagine the kids that saw their classmate get killed in front of their eyes. I saw the blood on the sign. I was there on the scene, two and a half hours standing there in a daze. Why? Because parents were grieving, crying, coming up to me, hugging me. Kobe, what do we do? And to be able to say, I don't know, is, is a tough feeling. What we've been doing is uh, going through training to make sure that, you know, God forbid something happens, you know, everyone in the building knows exactly what to do. 
Uh, what we've also done is uh, we've done assessment of, of all of our schools to see where our security strengths and deficits are and make sure that we're beefing up in the, and we've been adding additional resources to do that. Making sure there's cameras, there's electrified doors, um, and making sure that we're funneling all of the entrance into a school building through one common entryway that then they get screened by adults. So there's a lot that we've been doing and a lot that we're going, that we're going to do. Uh, but you know, this, is, this is something that keeps, keeps us up every single day as, uh, as policymakers as we, as we run the city. We need to make sure that if anything, kids feel safe and comfortable coming to school and it's an environment that's conducive to them continuing to learn. There is a lot of good common sense gun safety legislation that ought to pass. So things like um, the super long uh, magazines that have high capacity and can shoot large numbers of bullets is something. Uh, making sure that background checks happen. Uh, making sure that people who have various uh, problems in their lives that ought to keep them from having a gun that were effective about making sure they don't get those guns. We need to make sure our guns, again, are off the street. Anything and everything we can do, we need to be strategic with the police to make sure that happens. But it really needs to start. Guns are bad. Guns are not a good thing. Second Amendment issues are different. If you want to hunt, if you want to target practice, but that's not what we're talking about. I'm very supportive of the Second Amendment. I, I think you have to have common sense uh, gun laws, and I think we in fact have common sense gun laws in Rhode Island. We have a very comprehensive set of laws. I think, uh, depending on who's rating, we're amongst, uh, within the top 10 uh, most restrictive and protective gun laws in the country. Uh, but yet our citizens do have the right to bear arms and to protect themselves and to engage in sporting activities. So I, I think the balance is very appropriate, but I'm, I'm a very strong supporter of the Constitution uh, and uh, amongst all of the rights in the Constitution, the Second Amendment. I noticed a common theme on how the Second Amendment defines what it means to be an American and what the American experience itself is. Extraordinary freedoms. You know, freedom, uh, opportunity, we could list it. It's a, it's a land of opportunity. Raising uh, families in a place where we can uh, feel as though we're safe. Freedom. We have a right to bear arms and um, just have the freedom to develop and be who you want to be. That's what it means to be an American, and that's how the Second Amendment defines that. The reason the topic's a big thing is because there's no exact way to be an American. It all depends on your opinion, and everyone has something different, whether they believe like to be an American, you have the right to own guns, whether it's like, oh, I'm American, I'm allowed to say what I want, and how people take it. Similar to that, like it's all based on our freedoms and the choices that we make in society. Everybody has their own form of what the American dream is, and that's what we had to like bring into it. Great. How long did it take you to research, interview, shoot, and edit your documentary? Well, we started in September, around September 6th, that, that time, beginning of September, that's when we started filming. And as we went on, we found the theme and we decided that the Second Amendment was the amendment that we were going to cover. We decided that around, like, December. Did anything surprise you about making this process? So one thing that was surprising was seeing how much support you get from the community in your school and seeing that other politicians really do have, like, they do care for the topics they talk about. And to them, like, for example, others, like, I believe it was the Speaker of the House, Matt Yellow, who said that the way we took it, up, like, took it upon ourselves to go and find answers is, like, great. And that he said that we focus really hard and that we can do something with this if we continue. So it was just the support we get back. Also, what was really surprising was, like, how we got the politicians to meet with us. We, we thought they would have no time to come and meet with us, and we just tried, and they came. Overall, how fun the experience was, 
It was very great to be able to set up the professional setups that we did, send professional emails to our elected officials, and be able to meet these people and get an answer for a topic that's so broad. Did anything surprise? Oh, that was the surprise question. Okay, so this is the good question. How did you react when you found out you won a student cam prize? For our well, we was, we was very excited. <laughs> We was very excited because this was our first time entering and it put in a lot of hours of editing, a lot of contacting, and it was a long journey. So we were very excited and very happy and we look forward to participating again next year. With all honesty, it was something we couldn't believe and now it just makes us look forward because next year we're coming for the win, for sure. And it's crazy to think that it's our first year just entering something and we just didn't really think of it. We just Let's enter and let's see how it, how far we could go. And to think that we got second place on our first try is just blows my mind. Thank you. Welcome Trinity Academy for the Performing Arts, Tapa Stars, Tapa Ensemble, Community, Families, Students, Staff, what's up? Big shout outs to you guys, I must say. You are in the right place. This is the first virtual Tapa Film Festival presented to you by the Class of 2020 Tapa Film Majors. An extraordinary crew. All boys. Oh boy. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Seven of them. And they're outstanding. Some of them I've had since, geez, seventh grade, and they've just come so far. This year they've worked all year on pre-production, development, production, and post the editing process to develop their final senior thesis films. And this has been a, definitely a wild card year because we had to transition from being in a nice studio with nice setup to having to use what we have, using the phones in our pockets, using the apps that we could get, hopefully for free, and develop something, you know, and to me, you know, coming from, geez, the 90s, uh, when I had to make stuff on tape, and a part of me, you know, has to say, you know, this is, this is a good thing. You're having to adapt with the times. You're having to adapt what you have on you to create and document the things that are happening around you. So I think it was a phenomenal challenge and what, the thing I'm most proud of is that these type of film majors have had to do it all on their own. The fact that they've taken the Mr. Marcoux training wheels off and here they are going off into the real world to find what they'll find with these media literacy and filmmaking skills, right? Um, I love my TAPA ensemble dearly. Congratulations to the class of 2020. You're in for an outstanding show. Big shout out to Ayla Alquist, who has done a phenomenal job as adjunct filmmaker in residence. And big shout out to the Tapa Arts crew. You know, you guys do amazing work, and here we are pioneering the live streaming premiere experience. So, without further ado, we're going to get it kicked off. So, not quite sure what's happening after me because I'm probably still waiting for my films to come in overnight. But I hope you enjoy it and stay tuned and look for information about what's going to be happening. Keep that chat lively. I miss you guys dearly. Enjoy the show. Peace. the country at least 21 million kids now home from school the experts tell us look two weeks is too late uh, you know another week is too late you got to try to slow this thing down early 
We can't stop it, uh, but we can slow it down. Decisions with a massive impact for working parents and for all the children now spending the school day at home. Senior trips and proms have been canceled. Some fear graduation may be next. Alicia Barrera reached out to local school districts to find out the fate of graduation for the class of 2020. State competitions, prom, senior trips, and traditions canceled. Because these are once in a lifetime moments that, have, are, that are, are just banished. Class of 2020, we have had a rough senior year. The whole COVID-19 crisis struck the whole world by surprise. As a student from the class of 2020, I feel as if our senior year has been robbed by this widespread virus going around. It's almost as if we were living in a movie and senior year and the end of our school year got closer and closer without knowing exactly how we were going to finish off high school. We were deeply shocked, not knowing if we were going to get the chance to cross the stage for graduation or not knowing if prom was even going to happen. We had no clue on what was going to happen next. Crossing the stage is a very vital moment we have all been waiting for to get that feeling of yay, we finally did it in hopes of getting to see each other graduate and celebrate in this special moment together. This is a very important part in our lives and only happens once as high schoolers, an event where our families get to see that we finally made it through high school and many of us are first generation students, which makes it even more accomplishing. We worked so hard through these last 12 years of our lives to get to this point. As a result, we stood strong through all of this and supported one another when needed and also no other class could say they received the commencement speech from Barack Obama but the class of 2020. Congrats. Congratulations, class of 2020. Keep making us proud. Hey, I'm Patrick Feliz. Welcome to the Senior Art Show and enjoy the show. <sighs> Patrick, what are you doing? Patrick, come on, man. What the heck are you doing, bro? I just need something to do, man. Like, this thesis is getting me tight. What should I do? Joe. We should play some video games.
Hello all, this is your girl Nyla. This is a video message to my sister May Grace Marino. Mama Nadu, Garza, and Aussie. I miss you guys so much. Maya Naranja or Alma Gemela. Um Sasha Makaiden living in Philadelphia. I can say that I truly miss my friends. Um my little clique that I'm with every day, my dance company, my community. I really miss every single one of them. Hey guys, I want to give a shout out to all of the Tapa students. I really miss y'all. This message is for my brother Robert. Um, I know you're in lockdown and I can't see you indefinitely. Someone I miss a lot is Rob DeBlois, who's a friend and mentor of mine for many years since I was a little kid. And one of the world's, or one of the oldest living quadriplegics of his time. He spent 40 years as a quadriplegic and in that time, he founded and ran the UCAP school, which was a school he considered to be for students whose needs wouldn't otherwise be met, and he really believed that they should be. I feel like the person who I miss most around this time is my father. Um, I'm an adult. I'm 19. Amen. I just had a birthday, and I'm very blessed. And um, what I miss of all is um just his presence you know humor oh my god i miss the last i miss the times that we had um i miss the seafood um my mom um recently passed away from breast cancer and she was a strong woman every day like i think about her and everything i do i still think about her everything i do like there's not a day where i go without her you know and um it's hard you know like me being the youngest out of my siblings and me not seeing my mom really hurts but i knew that she was good and she was pure if i could explain how awesome my mom was like when she walked into the room she like lit up the whole room everybody was laughing um i just want to say that I love you. I think about you all the time. Um, Liam wanted to tell you that we ended up getting married and we miss you. He's a person I haven't seen in a long time and um, I just hope he's staying safe in these COVID times. And um, Uncle Felipe, if you see this, I hope you're all right. Give me a call. Um, I really miss my four grandparents a lot. Um, I was really lucky to grow up with them, an uh, important part of my life as a kid. Um, they've all passed over the last uh, 10 or so years, and I just really wish I had a chance to talk to them and let them know how much I miss the them, times love them, I was appreciate being open uh, how much they've impacted me the and my, my life. My grandmother was an artist, a painter, and an art teacher. My grandfather spent his life fighting for civil time, rights and social justice. We used to do this uh, game. Every day. At a gas station just to put the Talk to me. I'll check off on her. We were able, able to be open with people. Yeah. 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 It's been hard for me ever since this stuff started happening. All this stuff was just happening and died. Which I'm just trying to say that that feeling of fear and she moved on we were uh, uh, I didn't just insecurity I had in trusting yeah, her and trusting what we were creating and, and at the same time I'm really sorry I like that kid I'm sorry for goof I'm sorry for all of the times that never, you know, never I was never mad because you would I was too busy something. thinking about myself you that I didn't smile. realize that you were hurting. And I didn't realize that. Positivity that was in my eyes. And I was too busy being angry. I miss you now. It's outweighed. I miss you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. With one word, you can make everything okay. I miss your presence. I miss your energy. I miss my grandmother. I miss being able to tell you that I loved you. I miss being able to hug you. She was just but I know that you are here with me. You will forever be with me. I'm so grateful to be a part of your legacy. 
one day we're going to grab a Jane, you were an amazing woman. And if I can live every single day with the amount of compassion and kindness that you had for other people, I will be a better woman for it. I love you. Does every vote count equally under the Electoral College? 
This is an issue that has been brought up into our political discussions each time a presidential candidate does not win the popular vote, but wins electoral college. Is it important to our democracy that every vote counts equally? Our elected officials have divided opinions on this issue, and as the 2020 election intensifies, so are the discussions about this issue. Are we in a crossroad on what many candidates look at as the road to 270? The Electoral College is how the United States elects its president. According to Professor Emeritus of History at Columbia University Eric Foner, the Electoral College was created because the Founding Fathers were trying to give more representation to the southern states that had a high number of slaves with the Three-Fifths Clause. All 50 states have electoral votes allocated based on their population. If a candidate wins a majority of the votes in that state, they win all the electoral votes for that state, except for Nebraska and Maine where it's based on how a candidate performs in their congressional districts. The first candidate who wins 270 electoral votes becomes president. States like Rhode Island, Alabama, and Massachusetts in the past few election cycles are considered safe states since they consistently vote for the same party no matter who the candidate is. Swing states like Ohio, North Carolina, and Florida flip back and forth and switch to another party's candidates every other election cycle. So what are some of the pros and cons of the Electoral College? Honoring the historical compromise that existed and continuing that. There is at least some power given to the smaller states. And historically, if you go back to the, the time of our, our, our founding fathers, there was always the concern, and it was prescient, that one delegation or one cadre or one group of individuals would overwhelm the others. And so this has, gives the opportunity for a small state like Rhode Island to have and to maintain some type of say in the election of our president. The cons, obviously, it's just an antiquated system. Every other major country in the world has a popularity vote. We firmly believe in the majority rules, and people are bothered by the concept that someone could win without getting the majority of voters. There is a lot of controversy that surrounds the Electoral College. A good example of this is occasionally when a candidate wins the Electoral College, but not the popular vote. There have been four presidents elected this way, and John Quincy Adams who did not win either the popular vote or the Electoral College, which was decided in a tiebreaker vote in the U.S. House of Representatives. The current significance of the Electoral College did not come into our political discussions until the 2000 election between George W. Bush and Al Gore. Bush won the presidency narrowly in a 271 to 266 Electoral College victory. However, he lost the popular vote. The results had Gore winning with nearly 51 million votes to Bush's nearly 50 and a half million votes. This close election was decided by Florida. Since it was very close, this created controversy with many recounts and a Supreme Court case that was decided in Bush's favor, which awarded him the presidency. 16 years later, after the 2016 election, the Electoral College is back into our political spotlight. We have to acknowledge that the election cycle, the presidential election cycle of 2016, was probably one of the most unique in the history of our nation. The fact that we had that happen uh, where, where there was such a disparity between the popular vote and the Electoral College vote, and that people were actually surprised. I think not even the president himself thought that he might win. And, uh, there's a lot of people uh, for whom then this topic became very important. Each side was so invested in their candidate. Defeat was almost unacceptable to each side. People who are against the Electoral College argue that only a few states determine the presidential election. These states are Michigan, Wisconsin, Ohio, and Pennsylvania, where candidates spend more time and money. States like Rhode Island that only have four electoral votes won't get as much attention from a presidential candidate as much as a state in the Rust Belt. What could be done to ensure a voter in a state like Rhode Island's vote will count as much as any voter in any of the Midwestern swing states? you wouldn't have as much bang for the buck as you actually do get now. Our four electoral votes actually count for more than they do uh, if we went to national popular vote. They wanted them to also go to rural and smaller states, and that's why a state, no matter how small their population, gets three electoral college votes. I would suggest getting behind a candidate in hopes of uh, having a louder voice and talking to these swing states that um, you know could come down to uh, just a couple of votes. In this election cycle, we have seen a number of states make efforts to abolish the Electoral College. This would require a constitutional amendment process which requires a lot of support that is unlikely to happen in our current political landscape. What would truly be an effective way to elect our president if the Electoral College were abolished? 
I would suggest to some states maybe that win or not take all, where there is a county or regional vote. What we can do eventually is to change it to a straight out popular vote. We need to reform our election system to have a system of instant runoff voting. Instant runoff voting would be that if no one gets a majority on the first ballot, then the person with the least first votes is eliminated and the uh, votes are reapportioned based on that person's second choice. There are many arguments on whether or not the Electoral College should be abolished and if it is an outdated system. This film's purpose is not to answer that question, but rather to explain this issue, the questions that come with it, its importance in deciding the election of the country's highest office, and to call on our 2020 presidential candidates to address it. The 2020 presidential candidates should focus on this issue that no one is addressing, so that voters can feel confident that their vote counts equally. Hi, my name is Raven Bakari. I'm the creator of the senior film you're about to watch titled The Making of a Journalist. This is the first ever virtual show that we're doing for the senior film majors at TAPA, and I cannot believe that this film is finally done because the film was two years in the making, and it's a, it was a very ambitious project that covers the making of the first two C-SPAN student care mentories that me, Aiden Jovan, our amazing teacher, Mr. Marku, and the rest of the film majors created taking on the issues of, of the Second Amendment and the issue of gun violence in the United States and the Electoral College. The film itself is about 17, 16 to 17 minutes. It's a documentary. It has never before seen footage. It was a very fun project to make and I'm glad that it's finally done because it was a lot of hours of editing and a lot of looking at old footage and finding out what will work slash what wouldn't work when creating an objective documentary to cover the challenges that we faced as a team and how we overcame those. And my overall goal for this film I hope to achieve or have achieved is to explain and inspire others what it's like and how to successfully conquer any challenge that they are approaching or being approached by. And overall I feel like the film tells that story and wait till you see all the great footage that was there. There was hours and upon hours of it. So I had to narrow it down to create one cohesive story. Thank you to everybody involved in the making of the first C-SPAN student camp entry, the second C-SPAN student camp entry, and also technically this film, because without those two films, this film wouldn't exist. I hope you enjoyed the film. Throughout these past two years, I learned a lot of important lessons and skills when making both of my student cam entries. It was a period of growth because my teammates and I have been film majors for four years and the last two were the best in my opinion. We learned a lot of skills and life lessons that will benefit us in the long run with our careers throughout this experience. Throughout this period of growth, I realized how different our films were from grades 9 through 12. You guys were really into making comedic films and, and jumping onto really um, hilarious moments that spoke to you. And so there was a big sense of humor that we saw in your early work. Originally in like ninth grade, we kind of focused a lot on like memes and having fun. We were like, we put in a lot of work though, because it was something we really enjoyed doing. The span of time from ninth grade here to senior year has been an exceptional growth when it comes to technicality. Back then, you wouldn't be using a, a light. You know, you the first thing you would do is grab the camera and try to get a funky angle. Now I think you, you take a lot more time to set up your pieces and really think about the visual component on top of the content that you're bringing forth. 
And then as like we transitioned up until 10th grade, we didn't really do, we did like, we started more of working on like keyframes and the music video, which is probably the funnest unit because we did a lot of work, all of us, and they were all kind of like either funny or they were just really done well. And then 11th grade, we jumped into a huge documentary unit, which ended up going pretty far. The types of films that you've made have gone from being those humorous, kind of like slapstick, uh, young humor, to all of a sudden you're, you're making films that are trying to change public opinion and go after intense social political discussions. And then this year, we kind of just, I don't know, we took more like pride in our work and we kind of started early. We started doing our film work in the summer and then coming into TAPA and doing film work, we just continued where we left off in the summer. It's really refreshing to see students pick up that mature sensibility that can teach their teachers, their parents about the way life should be or the way the nation should be run. It's refreshing. Our films went from trying to make each other laugh to now taking on polarizing issues in American politics. It's no secret that this all started when we created our first student cam entry two years ago, all the way back in 2018. I first heard about the C-SPAN competition from Justin Mara, who was a history teacher here at TAPA. About four or five years ago, he started mentioning it to me. Oh, you guys should submit to this. So I was posting posters and oftentimes to be passed by student film majors. And, you know, I don't want to force any kind of competition or artistic direction for students. So I would suggest it to students, but you know, that one time that I posted on the, you know, on the door of the film lab last year, 2018, put it up on the door and you jumped right on it. And that got me excited because I knew you could win. This first entry called the Second Amendment with its unbearable consequences all started in September of 2018 when we interviewed Kobe Dennis, a community activist who was running to be mayor in the Democratic primary in Providence, Rhode Island. I had reached out to people running for public office all across Rhode Island, and the only person who had answered was Kobe. At this exact moment when I had interviewed him in September of 2018, I knew I wanted to pursue a career in broadcast journalism. The chance to meet Kobe was awesome because he's just a very personable person. When he walked in, he came and he was like, nah, I'm a real person, dapped us up. And I feel like he was really a community guy, so he kind of spoke a lot more to us than most of like general pol like politicians for me, at least. He really enjoyed meeting you guys and getting a chance to speak to the youth. What he said like made me really want to back him up. I was really focused on hoping that he won, that he went to the next step because he really was a great person for the community. He really cared a lot about younger people. So to hear that he was running for mayor and that we had the chance to actually interview him was, you know, there's a good feeling behind that. There was some challenges on the technical level for this interview. We had to shoot the interview in Mr. Marcou's office, which was a very small and tight space for about five people to do a three camera interview with three point lighting. It was shot up against a window, which was very tough to get the lighting on because it was very backlit and very bright. It was a very sunny day. However, with the team we had, we made it work and that interview looked great. There was another big challenge that we did not see coming until the day before the interview with Kobe and it ended up changing the whole direction of our film to focus on the Second Amendment and the issue of gun violence in the United States. It's time for us to come up with a sensible resolution. I saw the blood on the sign. I was there on the scene, two and a half hours standing there in a daze. Why? Because parents were grieving, crying, coming up to me, hugging me, Kobe, what do we do? And to be able to say, I don't know, is, is a tough feeling. It was the timing that came in with having someone from our, our state, our hometown, actually die to a shooting near school. And I feel like that's what made us really just focus on it. Our community was affected by it deeply because we had common friends, common family. We had a teacher that worked here that was working over there now. Um, so this shooting that occurred after school out front PCTA, uh, I believe, set it home for you guys that you were making this about the Second Amendment. 
That day had shocked the entire community, and it shocked us as students to see that happen in our own city. It was the spark that made Aiden, Jovan, and I want to create this film about the Second Amendment. We wanted to hold our elected officials accountable, and at the same time answer the theme revolving around the whole contest, which was what does it mean to be an American. In these interviews, I would ask the toughest questions I could think of about the topic, their passion and origins when it comes to politics, and about their job performance in general. This started with the interview after Kobe, where we had interviewed the mayor of Providence, Jorge Alorza. That was a little different because we were shooting it now in the boardroom, so it was a little bit more of a controlled setup. He's more prepared for controversial questions, even when it comes to students. He, he knows he's got to be very careful with the, what he says and presents. I remember there was some kind of moment. You always ask each one of these politicians something controversial which I think gained you a lot of respect from them. They'd be like, oh, okay, he's not just giving me the easy student questions that are gonna be all nice and please give me a recommendation later. He would actually like kind of confront them with some tough questions here and there that would literally were specific to them personally. So for example, was when Ray asked him about the trips and how his whole like face completely changed, went from smiling to... And once the hard questions started coming, he changed his whole facial expression. He was just, he just stopped being a politician. He, he, he just got mad, just got mad. And if I remember correctly, we were looking at the questions and I was like, you should maybe save this question towards the end because we don't want to like get him feeling like you're going to be going after him about these like difficult topics right off the bat. Get the questions off the top that you know you need to get and then go for that hard question. That question being... One thing many of your critics talk about, especially with this campaign, is your out-of-state trips. So my third question is, what would your response be to all the recent criticism of your out-of-state trips to places like Texas and Arizona? And... He was a little on the edge of his seat there. The next interviews were just getting better and better in every way possible. In film terms, we had our signature look. Our location was in the boardroom in our old building at 150 Washington Street. We had the best setup with three-point lighting and two cameras where one would be pointing at me and the other would be pointing at the guest that we were interviewing. And the drive we had was not only to win this contest, but now just to get out the message that we were hoping to get to our elected officials to hold them accountable on such a very polarized issue in American politics. It wasn't all good moments, though. As a team, we did have our challenges. One in particular was for an interview that we really needed, because this person's perspective that we were hoping to get at that point in the film process we didn't have, and that was our interview with Rhode Island Speaker of the House, Nicholas Mattiello. I remember saying, I was setting up B-Cam, then 30 minutes go by, Raymond goes, he's not coming. So I just, I was mad, I was mad. So I just took every, the whole B-Cam, put it in the bag, tripod, carried everything. Right when I stepped out the door, he walked by and I was like, oh, he's here. <laughs> oh, so I just ran back, set B-Cam up, lights went on, everything. And it looked like we were, it looked like we like been, prepared for like two hours. That was so clutch because you needed his perspective. You needed Mattiello's perspective there. Um, he has a unique perspective that we didn't have and it, it kind of came in clutch for the way you were creating an objective dialogue. It really was. Although we did have that challenge of Speaker Mattiello showing up late, the interview went a lot better than expected given the situation. Keep working hard, you're gonna be really successful. What you're doing here, what you learn in school, it's gonna build your future. So keep working hard, keep being interested, keep learning. You're building a foundation for the future. That was the last interview for the first film that we submitted. Shortly after we had submitted that, after putting it all together in post-production, it was a great sense of relief once it was submitted because just to see what all the work had culminated to and then to find out the results a couple months later, we had won second place in the Eastern region. Second place, it was, it was like, I don't know, it felt like a sting to the neck, but a good one. Because during the time we had a joke, we were like, watch this get second place. Like we were just laughing about it and it really happened. So that was like the sting on the neck, but it was a great thing. We still placed 
top three nationally. We won second place in the whole nation. Like, a couple kids from Rhode Island won second place for C-SPAN. Second place, whole nation. This new film titled The Road to 270 was overall in every aspect better than our first one. When they announced the theme, which was to address the issue we want the 2020 presidential candidates to address in their campaign, I thought of doing this one about the Electoral College. Once we had the idea, I made a list of every way I could be different from last year's film. Last year we only interviewed Democrats and one Independent. This year we interviewed Progressive Democrats, Moderate Democrats, Republicans, and even a Libertarian. Last year had default supers with just Times New Roman text in the bottom corner from Final Cut Pro X. This year I made graphics from Photoshop that looked even better than last year's supers and even an original logo so people knew what the film was about as soon as they saw it. Last year we started in September, this year we started in July and finished all the interviews by October which gave us about three months of post-production time. This is an issue that has been brought up into our political discussion each time we for uh, three. You can say it's like slowly. Two, one. This is an issue that has been brought up into our political discussion each time a presidential candidate does not win the popular vote, but wins the electoral college. The film had a lot of ideas we had to put together in a six minute time frame, which is part of the rules for the contest. But I had this gut feeling that this was going to be our year and that we were going to take the win. And I feel like that wasn't just me who thought that. In all honesty, I feel that we have a winning film, that we put in a lot of work in our film, and we do have a lot of support backing us up with fan voting, so I hope either to see us on top, well, I hope to see us on top for the win, as well as very close to fan favorite. I think it's kind of hilarious, and I'm going to quote our head of school, Miss Richard Tegnauer, on this, when she first saw the film. She said, if this doesn't win first place, she wants a recount. I agree with that. <laughs> I haven't seen the other films, but man, the amount of critique and work that went into the editing process and really fleshing this out. I mean, production quality, sound quality, content wise, the electoral college. I mean, come on, like this country needs like change in its voting practices, I believe. Um, I don't know, I just think you guys hit the nail on the head when it came to topic, quality of product. You know, I don't know, Ray. I'm gunning for number one for you guys. We'll see. It was announced. We won second place in the East again. It was great. We got to do it again and still have a film in the national spotlight focused on the issue that we wanted the candidates to address. And then after talking about it with Mr. Marcoud later that day, we had a long conversation about the process in the film and, you know, thinking about everything that we did for the film and how it still won second. But then thinking about that and that conversation, I realized that there's one big message to learn from this whole experience. Getting to the top isn't the answer. That shows a good artist, you know, someone that can constantly go forward despite the obstacles despite potential letdowns it's important not to just give in the towel when everything is against you or everyone's telling you it's impossible you need to keep going even if you know you're gonna lose you need to use that momentum and surpass everything despite all the powers involved because you're getting your voice out and that's power and that power is going to cascade down the line. And every now and then you beat the odds. The real check is in the mail, but they got $1,500. Yeah.